Alrighty. Much better show than last week, TNA. Well done. Also, much better go-home show than last month. Arguably TNA's best go-home show in quite a long time. Wasn't without its problems, mind you. This is mainly on the strength of the hype for three specific matches, but they were three of the four quote-unquote big matches on this pay-per-view card, so that counts for a lot. The main problem of the show that did hold it back from hyping up the rest of the lockdown card better was, not shockingly, the Eric Young ODB wedding angle. Now, regardless of whether you enjoyed this or not, the bottom line is this thing had a lot of time devoted to it. Close to 20 minutes, I think, which would be overkill for these two even under normal circumstances. But considering this was a go-home show, and at the time I'm recording this, none of the people involved are booked for lockdown, you really have to question what the writers were thinking when they allocated so much time to this, because that was time that storylines much more important than this one needed and didn't get. And that ended up really negatively affecting the hype for the rest of this pay-per-view, but I'll get to that. For now, let's start at the beginning. First of all, shout out to that Impact Zone crowd. I don't know where this crowd came from, but not only were they awake, but they were hot for everything. That had to be the hottest Impact Zone crowd TNA has had probably in years. And I'm not even exaggerating about that. They couldn't have asked for a better go-home show crowd than this because it made this show come off very well and seem very exciting. I mean, even during the parts that I didn't like, I had to admit, man, this crowd is going apeshit for everything they're doing tonight. And that crowd immediately endeared itself to me in the opening segment. Eric Bischoff comes out, and as soon as he opens his mouth, the crowd starts chanting, We don't care! We don't care! We don't care! <laughs> that was awesome. So Bischoff introduces his lethal lockdown team of Bully Ray, Gunner, Christopher Daniels, and Kazarian. Kazarian, former member of Fortune, who turned on Bischoff about a year ago, and spent most of the remainder of 2011 feuding against Immortal. And Bischoff trusts him... why exactly? I don't know. Kaz is a heel again, so I guess that's all the explanation we're gonna get on that one. So then Garrett comes out... And he cuts another painfully amateurish promo, once again displaying that his charisma level is stuck at absolute zero. In fact, you know what this guy reminds me of? You know when you go to a wedding reception and the best man or someone makes a toast, but sometimes it'll be a guy who might not be the greatest public speaker, or maybe he didn't really plan out or rehearse what he was going to say beforehand, so he just tries to wing it, and you're pretty much just counting the seconds until someone takes the microphone away from him? That's Garrett Bischoff. That's what he sounds like. And I've been to a lot of weddings, okay? So just trust me, the comparison fits. Anyway, this started a three-match series to determine the man advantage for Lethal Lockdown. It ended up being the main angle of the show and got the bulk of the screen time, and that worked out. Because when Garrett didn't have a microphone in his hand, it actually went really well. Gunner vs. Ken Anderson was pretty decent, even though the finish was kind of stupid. AJ Styles vs. Bully Ray was solid, and Christopher Daniels vs. Austin Aries was terrific. So that was three good matches we got in service of hyping Lethal Lockdown, and thankfully none of this focused too much on Garrett, so it came off just fine. Now, there was a lot of business going on during and after the third match, so Hogan comes out, and he makes Lethal Lockdown 5-on-5 five five instead of 4-on-4. Four four. Long story short, Bischoff puts himself on his team, which I hate, but it does provide a way for the heels to lose this match without Garrett pinning one of the wrestlers, and that's definitely a good thing. Bischoff only did this thinking Hogan was going to do likewise, and after a little bit of a tease, Hogan and Garrett are like, no, 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 it's RVD. And honestly, I really didn't care about that. I don't care for RVD at all anymore, but Van Dam on the face team beats the living hell out of Hogan or Sting being on the face team, and his return was executed well, and it felt impactful, I will admit. So, all things considered, this could have gone a hell of a lot worse. So, Lethal Lockdown Hype gets a thumbs up. The Motor City Machine Guns cut an in-ring promo. Their entrance was not shown on camera. Hey, TNA, you know how to present someone like a star? One of the first things you do is you show their fucking entrance. You people are fools! A lot of entrances got cut this week. It's never a good thing when that happens, because it makes the show seem unprofessional and rushed. 
And if you saw this show, then you know what the reason for this was, and bear with me, I'm almost there. So the guns sound off on Joe and Magnus, who then come out to respond and set up their tag title match at the pay-per-view. Strong promos from everyone, pretty basic stuff, but very effective. It got over that there's a mutual respect here, these are the top two teams in the company, they consider themselves the top two teams in the world, and this match is going to be about bragging rights as much as it is about the titles. They're fighting for the unofficial title of best tag team in the world today, which makes sense for a big show like Lockdown. And some people have been questioning whether throwing Saban and Shelley into this spot when there was so little time to build up the match was the right call. After watching this segment, now do you understand? They were the only team you could put in this spot. They're the only team TNA could put in there with Joe and Magnus that would deliver a segment like this and have people buy into it. Because the Motor City Machine Guns can say they're the best tag team in the world, and I don't think a lot of people are going to dispute that, in or out of kayfabe. I mean, even Magnus didn't disagree with it. And that's why this worked, because there's a credibility there that the guns have earned in the eyes of the fans as well as the other members of the tag team division, and that's something you just can't manufacture. I mean, Mexican America sure as hell wouldn't deliver a segment like this. No one would buy that for a second. Speaking of those two idiots, just when an impromptu match is about to start, Hernandez and Anarchia come out. Ha ha! Anarchia cuts an awful, unintelligible promo, and him and Hernandez won in on this because they think they should be in the tag title picture as well. I'm laughing at you. <laughs> so Mexican America jump in the ring and try to start some shit, and in a matter of moments, Joe, Magnus, Saban, and Shelley make them look like the biggest jobbers on earth. <laughs> really? It's almost comical how quickly they were dispatched. We are not in 2011 anymore, and admittedly, I did groan when they came out, as did a lot of other people, I'm sure, but this actually worked out perfectly because the champs and the guns were about to come to blows, and this gave them someone to beat up without beating up each other. You know, they did a little one-upsmanship here, so both teams look strong heading into the pay-per-view now. And in a weird way, this is kind of the most intriguing matchup on the card because it's inarguably the two best tag teams in the company, both calling themselves the best tag team in the world, and they have not touched each other. I mean, every other match is a rematch from last month or six months ago or whenever, or it's the blow-off match for a feud that's been going on for a while. This one is completely fresh, and that works in its favor. I mean, everyone I've talked to pretty much considers this to be one of their most highly anticipated lockdown matches, and I tend to agree with that. Yes, the build-up was last minute, but they sold me on the match, so good for them. Jeff Hardy comes out and cuts a promo on Kurt Angle. This was the only hype their match got. And this is where we started to see how badly skewed the writer's priorities were this week. Because this promo was so short, I honestly wondered why they even bothered including it at all. This just made Angle and Hardy a lockdown look like more of an afterthought than anything else. And part of me wonders if this was by design, because Angle is injured, and they might not know if he's going to be able to perform up to his usual standards, so maybe they wanted to downplay this, lest they raise people's expectations too high and then not deliver. I understand that, but good grief. I mean, to have two of your top guys, two of your biggest money makers from WWE, get so little time devoted to their feud on the lockdown go-home show... I honestly have no idea what they were thinking, especially considering what ended up getting that screen time instead. Destination? Horror. Ugh, here we go. So ODB and Eric Young had their wedding in the steel cage. <coughs> At one point, Sarita and Rosita came out, and God bless them, they tried to put a stop to this. They tried to seduce Eric and lure him away from ODB by stripping down and showing off the goods. The only redeeming thing about this segment, in my opinion. But then ODB had to ruin it by stripping down herself. And then, because that just wasn't enough, Eric Young took his clothes off. Because that's one of his gimmicks, remember? Will you sit down and quit making a fool out of yourself? And after that, just for good measure, the minister took his clothes off. I guess he just wanted to fit in. This whole show is ridiculous! Oh, God. This is going to be a really polarizing topic. How you felt about this one is going to come down to personal preference. For me, it was nothing short of excruciating. 
Except for the Sarita Rosita striptease. Good God, Sarita's body is unbelievable. But casual viewers probably got a kick out of this segment. The live crowd seemed to really enjoy it, and I haven't seen what viewership this did yet, but the knockouts, when put in the hour main event segment of quarter four and quarter five, tend to draw high ratings more often than not. So I understand why they would want to do a big entertainment segment like this. Now, if it was an effective one remains to be seen, but the fact that this was stretched out as long as it was, whether it was to get ratings or not isn't the issue, had a horrible ripple effect on this show. Angle and Hardy got maybe two minutes of hype, if that, Crimson and Matt Morgan did not even appear this week, and they should have because they were pretty much thrown under the bus last week, too. Numerous entrances were cut to make time for this, making several other segments feel rushed, all to accommodate a segment in which none of the participants are currently booked for lockdown. Now, sure, they might add the match at the last minute. They've done that plenty of times. But even if that happens, did anything that occurred here really make you anxious to see these two teams square off in a steel cage? Really questionable to feature this so heavily, in my opinion. I hope it works out for them. I hope they get some ratings from this, because a lot of the final hype for some big lockdown matches was done away with to make time for it. They had a knockouts tag team match with Mickey and Velvet versus Gale and Madison. The match was actually pretty decent. The faces go over when Velvet Sky pins Gale Kim. Oh my god, he's, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna, he's coming in here! He's got a puke! He's got a puke! He's got a puke! Yeah, he's got a puke! And as much as I hated seeing that, it did give me at least a sliver of hope that Gale might retain the title this Sunday. You know, Booking 101 tells us that if the face wins in the go-home show, the heel retains at the pay-per-view. But with the way this company operates, they'd probably have Velvet win the title the next night on Impact if that happened. But hey, at least there's a little bit of hope now that Gale might keep the title. As I said, the match was alright. Unfortunately, it just wasn't interesting to me. It's Gale, Mickey, Velvet, Madison. How many times have we seen this now? Again, it's just the same women in the same spots. Lather, rinse, repeat. I hate to say it, but the knockout division is just not sucking me in right now. The whole thing just feels very, very stale. And part of that is because too damn many of them have had title reigns, rendering the titles meaningless, which I talked about last week. And part of it is because they really haven't shaken up the knockout status quo in a long time now. New female talent is badly needed. In fact, if it were up to me, I would seriously just clean house on the women's roster at this point. I'd keep some of them for recognizability and star power and stuff, but I would get rid of a bunch of them and get a big influx of new talent from the indies. I don't know why Tracy Brooks is still on the roster. Winter and Angelina have become irrelevant and the writers don't seem to want to use them for anything except jobbing occasionally. Now, imagine if they cut some of these people and replaced them with women like Alyssa Flash, Athena, Jennifer Blake, Veda Scott, and the Blossom Twins. Now, wouldn't that make this division a hell of a lot more interesting than what we have now? Just think about it. Now, thankfully, the final segment of the night was reserved not for Hogan, but for James Storm and Bobby Roode, as it should be. This was their final confrontation before lockdown. This was what all the hype videos were leading up to, the final push for the main event this Sunday. So naturally, this promo had to deliver in a big way. It started off slow, with them sort of recapping their history together, and then the Bound for Glory series, and then it started getting intense, with Storm saying how Rude killed beer money and destroyed their friendship, and Rude counters with, Friendship? Bullshit! We were never friends! We hated each other! The only thing we ever had in common was such and such. And then they really started tearing into each other, and they were about to explode by the end of this thing. And if you had to watch any segment of this show, it was this one. I will be shocked if this is not promo of the year, at least for this company. It was that good. This. This right here. This is what Bobby Roode has been missing. For months, he's been going around with It Factor This and Leader of the Selfish Generation That. And I kept waiting to see that passion and emotion from him. Like he was showing in his promos on Jared and Hogan last year. Because I know he can show that stuff when he wants to. Here we finally got it. James Storm brought it too, and this was fucking Dynamite, passion, emotion, intensity. This is how you build a pay-per-view main event TNA. Now I'm excited. I don't know why you don't do stuff like this every month. Go out of your way to see this segment. Even if you didn't watch the show this week, go to the YouTube page and watch this promo. If that doesn't get you hyped to see this match, nothing will. So they ended the go-home show with a bang, exactly what they needed to do. I, I really can't say enough good things about that promo. 
And the rest of the show was really good too, not counting the wedding, which I'm sure some people loved and some people hated. Also, Hogan was only in one segment, and it was just used to hype Lethal Lockdown and provide a cliffhanger for a commercial break, and that's it. So Hogan was not overexposed this week. That helped a lot. So this was a great show in and of itself. As a go-home show, it did have some problems. The matches they focused on, they did a great job with, but the wedding angle ate up way too much time, and because they spent so long on this, they didn't have any time to hype up other matches like Morgan Crimson and Angle Hardy. And the rest of the show was hurt by this too. You could see how certain segments were cut away from very quickly without getting time to breathe. You could tell they were cutting corners in a lot of areas to make time for this, and I just didn't agree with it. To compromise a really important show this much just to spotlight two goofball comic relief characters really felt like a huge mistake to me. Even if it got ratings, which it doesn't look like it did, too much lockdown hype was sacrificed for this to be a good idea. Regardless of that though, the matches that were hyped were hyped very well. And that final segment? Fan-fucking-tastic! Most of the main selling points of the pay-per-view were covered. Other matches did get the short end of the stick, but... Hell, I didn't give a rat's ass about Robbie E versus Devon anyway. Enjoy lockdown. See you next week. Damn Eric Young. How the hell does a clown like that get a woman like Sarita trying to seduce him? Eh. Must be the beard. Hmm. The beard, eh?